I had this consciousness that prison was not an abyss for me, but the most important turning point in my life. The Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn is a three-volume investigative history of the Gulag prison system in the Soviet Union. The book explains the origins of the system, how it operated, and what impact it had on society. Most importantly, the book shed light on a side of Soviet Russia that was virtually unknown to the outside world. Solzhenitsyn himself was imprisoned in the Gulags after writing a letter that was critical of Stalin. Not long after his sentence came to an end, Solzhenitsyn began writing the Gulag Archipelago in secret at great personal danger. When the book was published, it won the Nobel Prize for Literature and has been credited with helping to bring down the Soviet Union. Time Magazine has called it the best nonfiction book of the 20th century. Many proponents of the Gulag Archipelago view it simply as an expose of the Soviet Union, and it certainly is to some extent. American diplomat George F. Kennan said that the book was, quote, the most powerful single indictment of a political regime ever to be levied in modern times, close quote. On the other side of things, critics of the Gulag Archipelago rightly say that the book is full of inaccuracies and was written with a poor investigative approach. After having read the book for myself, I feel like both its critics and proponents are missing the real value of the book. The Gulag Archipelago certainly had a big impact in the political world at the time, but it is also full of profound insights into human nature that are not given the credit they deserve. This book not only captures the tremendous scale of human suffering that occurred in the Soviet Union, it also captures the understanding and insights that emerged from that suffering. The purpose of this video is to help people see past the usual commentary that surrounds the book and shed light on the value it has for people on an individual level. In reference to the people reading this book for the wrong reasons, Solzhenitsyn writes, Let the reader who expects this book to be a political expose slam its covers shut right now. If only it were all so simple. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? It is for this reason that I will be focusing primarily on takeaways relevant to human nature and self-improvement, since in my view that is the biggest value to be found in the Gulag Archipelago. To capture this value accurately, I will be quoting heavily from the book. The prisoners in the Gulag prison system, or the natives of the archipelago as Solzhenitsyn calls them, experienced many injustices during their time in the camps. Unjust arrests, unjust prison sentences, torture, forced labor, and murder, all committed in the name of ideology and the pursuit of power. These atrocities abound in the pages of the Gulag Archipelago to the point that it almost becomes tedious reading through them all. There were so many terrible things that happened during this time that it is difficult to wrap our minds around the scale of it. Even more difficult is to comprehend the fact that hardly anyone was brought to justice for the crimes that were committed. It is clear enough that those men who turned to the handle of the meat grinder even as late as 1937 are no longer young. They have lived the best years of their lives prosperously, well-nourished, and comfortable, so that it is too late for any kind of equal retribution as far as they are concerned. But let us be generous. We will not shoot them. We will not pour salt water into them, nor bury them in bed bugs, nor bridle them into a swan dive, nor keep them on sleepless stand-up for a week, nor kick them with jackboots, nor beat them with rubber truncheons, nor squeeze their skulls in iron rings, nor push them into a cell so that they lie on top of one another like pieces of baggage. We will not do any of the things they did, but for the sake of our country and our children, we have the duty to seek them all out and bring them all to trial, not to put them on trial so much as their crimes. We have to condemn publicly the very idea that some people have the right to repress others. In keeping silent about evil, and burying it so deep within us that no sign of it appears on the surface, we are implanting it, and it will rise up a thousandfold in the future. When we neither punish nor reproach evildoers, we are not simply protecting their trivial old age, we are thereby ripping the foundations of justice from beneath new generations. It is for this reason, and not because of the weakness of indoctrination work, that they are growing up indifferent. Young people are acquiring the conviction that foul deeds are never punished on earth that they always bring prosperity. It is going to be uncomfortable, horrible, to live in such a country. It wasn't enough that the Soviet Union thought out over time. Damage had been done to society on a moral level that needed to be repaired. This damage was impairing the current state of society and risked jeopardizing it long into the future. This is because there was no right and wrong. 
there was only power in ideology. These two things helped make the atrocities of the gulags possible and give continued justification for them generation after generation. The history of nations is entirely a history of revolutions and seizures of power, and whoever succeeds in making a more successful and more enduring revolution is from that moment on graced with the bright robes of justice, and his every past and future step is legalized and memorialized in odes, whereas every past and future step of his unsuccessful enemies is criminal and subject to arraignment and a legal penalty. To do evil, a human being must first of all believe that what he's doing is good, or else that it's a well-considered act in conformity with natural law. Fortunately, it is in the nature of the human being to seek a justification for his actions. Macbeth's self-justifications were feeble, and his conscience devoured him. Yes, even Iago was a little lamb too. The imagination and the spiritual strength of Shakespeare's evildoers stopped short at a dozen corpses because they had no ideology. Ideology. That is what gives evildoing its long-sought justification and gives the evildoer the necessary steadfastness and determination. That is the social theory which helps to make his acts seem good instead of bad in his own and others' eyes, so that he won't hear the reproaches and curses, but will receive praise and honors. That was how the agents of the Inquisition fortified their wills, by invoking Christianity, the conquerors of foreign lands, by extolling the grandeur of their motherland, the colonizers, by civilization the Nazis by race, and the Jacobins, early and late, by equality, brotherhood, and the happiness of future generations. Thanks to ideology, the 20th century was fated to experience evil doing on a scale calculated in the millions. This cannot be denied, nor passed over, nor suppressed. How, then, do we dare insist that evildoers do not exist, and who was it that destroyed these millions? Without evildoers, there would have been no archipelago. Throughout the book, Solzhenitsyn laments the lack of resistance. In addition to the nickname Natives, he also nicknamed the prisoners Rabbits because they were so submissive and controllable. Why did people not do more to resist tyranny when the punishments were so arbitrary? Why did they not resist when they knew they were going to die anyways? One reason is because of the ideological dominance that the government had. Its influence had become so ingrained in society that people no longer had their own individual point of view. They didn't have their own genuine ideology of opposition, on the strength of which they could step aside and on which they could take their stand. As a result, once people became alienated from the party, they became completely powerless because the party was everything. In order to do anything in society, they had to be in good standing with the party. They did all they could not to fall out of favor with it, even if they were not in the wrong. People also did not resist out of hope that they would be proven innocent. They believed they were innocent and did not want to jeopardize their position. Some would hold on to this hope until the moment of their execution. They were unable to fully wrap their heads around their predicament until it was too late. Many who did come to understand their situation attempted to thwart their circumstances via suicide. Solzhenitsyn considered suicide in the camps to be submission rather than resistance. Additionally, resistance was further dampened by the reign of criminals within the camps. The political prisoners were treated worse than those in prison for conventional crimes like murder, rape, and theft. These criminals were given free reign to exploit the political prisoners at will. They were their own separate class within the prison system. Having to deal with the constant threat of the criminals made resistance more difficult than it otherwise would have been, because they were suppressed by both the criminals and the prison administration. Despite the odds not being in prisoners' favor, Solzhenitsyn believed that bravery was still worthwhile even in the face of these odds. So what is the answer? How can you stand your ground when you are weak and sensitive to pain? when people you love are still alive, when you are unprepared? What do you need to make you stronger than the interrogator and the whole trap? From the moment you go to prison, you must put your cozy past firmly behind you. At the very threshold, you must say to yourself, my life is over, a little early to be sure, but there's nothing to be done about it. I shall never return to freedom. I am condemned to die, now or a little later. But later on, in truth, it will be even harder, and so the sooner the better. I no longer have any property whatsoever. For me, those I love have died, and for them I have died. From today on, my body is useless and alien to me. One story of courage came from an old religious woman who was arrested and interrogated for sheltering an innocent fugitive. They wanted to find the underground network that had helped him escape, but she refused to reveal it to them, saying, There is nothing you can do with me even if you cut me into pieces. After all, you are afraid of your bosses, and you are afraid of each other and you are even afraid of killing me. 
but I am not afraid of anything. I would be glad to be judged by God right this minute. There were a handful of stories like hers that emerged from the camps over the years. Many other heroic stories will likely never be known because they died with their heroes. Solzhenitsyn thought that if only more people had been courageous in society before the camps came about, that they might have been able to prevent things from turning out the way they did. We have gotten used to regarding as valor only valor in war, or the kind that's needed for flying in outer space, the kind which jingle jangles with metals. We have forgotten another concept of valor, civil valor, and that's all our society needs. Just that, just that, just that. That's all we need, and that's exactly what we haven't got. As odd as it sounds, Alexander Solzhenitsyn ultimately saw his imprisonment and exile as a good thing. His experiences had a remarkably transformative impact on his life. Despite the hardship he endured, he saw his imprisonment as being invaluable for his own personal development. Maybe it was for the best. Without both those experiences, I would not have written this book. I had this consciousness that prison was not an abyss for me, but the most important turning point in my life. It didn't matter that I was in prison. Evidently, they were not going to shoot me, and in the end, I would become wiser here. I would come to understand many things here, heaven. I would correct my mistakes yet, O oh heaven. Not for them, but for you, heaven. I had come to understand those mistakes here, and I would correct them. In some areas of the Gulag prison system, relatives of those imprisoned would be allowed to send packages to their imprisoned loved ones. Alexander looked down on this practice, saying that it was a poisoned gift, because... It transforms you from a free, though hungry person into one who is anxious and cowardly, and it deprives you of that newly dawning enlightenment, that toughening resolve, which are all you need for your descent into the abyss. O oh, wise gospel saying about the camel and the eye of the needle, these material things will keep you from entering the heavenly kingdom of the liberated spirit. And thus it is that we have to keep getting banged on flank and snout again and again so as to become, in time at least, human beings. Yes human beings. Occasionally, individual prisoners would be transported to neighboring prisons via a special convoy. Out of convenience, this entailed using the public transportation system rather than prison vehicles. A prisoner in civilian clothes would be escorted by a guard in civilian clothes using public trains and buses. During his prison term, Alexander was transported in such a way from one prison to another. This brief exposure to the free world ended up being a profound experience for him. After a few hours of being around people he thought were free, he discovered that a huge spiritual gap now separated him from them and that he was more free than they were. You listen to all this, and the goose pimples of rejection run up and down your spine. To you, the true measure of things in the universe is so clear, the measure of all weaknesses and all passions. And these sinners aren't fated to perceive it. The only one there who is alive, truly alive, is incorporeal you and all these others are simply mistaken in thinking themselves alive. Do not pursue what is illusory, property and position, all that is gained at the expense of your nerves decade after decade and is confiscated in one fell night. Live with a steady superiority over life. Don't be afraid of misfortune and do not yearn after happiness. It is, after all, all the same. The bitter doesn't last forever and the sweet never fills the cup to overflowing. It is enough if you don't freeze in the cold, and if thirst and hunger don't claw at your insides. If your back isn't broken, if your feet can walk, if both arms can bend, if both eyes see, if both ears hear, then whom should you envy, and why? Our envy of others devours us most of all. Rub your eyes and purify your heart, and prize above all else in the world, those who love you and who wish you well. Do not hurt them or scold them, and never part from any of them in anger. After all, you simply do not know. It might be your last act before your arrest, and that will be how you are imprinted in their memory. And after spending a few hours among free people, here is what I feel. My lips are mute. There is no place for me among them. My hands are tied here. I want free speech. I want to go back to my native land. I want to go home to the archipelago. After hearing Solzhenitsyn speak about all the wonderful things he gained from his prison experience, it might be tempting to think of the gulags in more positive terms. It might also be easy to say that he was institutionalized, or that he had Stockholm Syndrome, or even that he thought the atrocities that took place were somehow a good thing. I might not have included enough of it here, but the book makes it very obvious that what happened in the Soviet Union was a tragedy and should have been prevented. He simply made the most of his circumstances. He wasn't taking part in the lie. On the contrary, his suffering freed him from the lie. His lack of property, position, and comfort granted him a unique perspective that he found to be very valuable. It was the silver lining of his otherwise dark experience. 
Our suffering does not happen in vain if we find personal transformation in it. However, failing to find personal transformation from suffering will ensure that it did happen in vain. Solzhenitsyn gives us a good example of how people can face suffering head-on and emerge from it better than they were before. A final takeaway from this book that I found interesting was a brief comment Solzhenitsyn made about spiritual abilities. Solzhenitsyn came away from his experiences with newfound enlightenment, a robust sense of humor that permeates the book, and also a unique spiritual ability. He described using what he called his secret sensor relay to help him guide his actions in prison. According to him, it was an inborn spiritual sensor that he would rely on constantly to survive his experiences. For example, determining who was trustworthy and who wasn't. He said he had never heard anyone talk about such a thing before, and further described it as a miracle that exists in many people, but often remains undeveloped because we live in an age that relies too much on rationality and technology. It sounds to me like he is describing what has often been referred to by others as a conscience, an inner voice, or the spirit. This concludes my takeaways from Volume 1 of the Gulag Archipelago. The things I have talked about in this video represent only a small part of the insights to be found in this book. I highly recommend it and will return soon with takeaways from Volume 2. Thank you for watching.